Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. We are going to do Psalm 90 and 91 um, tonight. Um, I just, they're just, these are two of the most awesomest psalms, and they're back to back, so that's what's keeping me from doing three, because I can barely, I'm not even sure I'm going to get all, all of these in tonight. We'll see. Here's just a reminder of what Psalms is all about. We are meant to live as people. Okay, I'll restart that. Frank, you tell me when you, when you got the sound up. I only got two videos from my show, and this is the only one with noise. We are meant to live as people who go. praise our Creator. Yet our experiences sometimes make this difficult. We are hurt. We hurt others. The world is a big, giant mess. The Psalms offer answers for all these circumstances. They give us the words to lament with. They give us the words to celebrate with. They help us when we're together and when we're alone. But the focus of the Psalms is always upon God himself. The Psalms are always directed towards God. Their viewpoint is that all viewpoints should look to God and praise him. And when you can't praise, cry out to him in honesty. Yell at God if you have to, but just keep talking. And keep listening. Let the conversation go on. So, Psalm 90. I'm titling this psalm, Wise Faith. Hopefully you'll understand where I, where I got that title from as we work our way through it. Psalm 90. The title says it is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Written by Moses, that makes this psalm the oldest psalm out of the 150 in the book of Psalms. Not necessarily the oldest song in the Bible. There may be some other things. There's some stuff in the book of Job. But from, uh, from the book of Psalms, this is the only one written by Moses, and that makes this the oldest. Moses also wrote other songs that are not in the book of Psalms. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, whole chapter, big, big, huge, long so uh, song that he wrote to teach a lesson to the Israelites. If you look at the life of Moses, I think we can kind of pinpoint some of the, the, the time frame of roughly when this psalm may have been written. I kind of think that it's probably written due to the events that take place in Numbers 13 and 14. And just to kind of build some background to this psalm, the children of Israel have been delivered out of Moses. Uh, out of Moses. <laughs> Boy, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> They've been delivered out of Egypt, and it's, and it's at Mount Sinai, after they've crossed through the Red Sea, that they're given the, 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 law, of Moses, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the whole, the whole shebang at Mount Sinai. This nation of slaves goes through a process of being transformed from slaves into an organized army. Then God leads them up to the border of the Promised Land, to a place called Kadesh Barnea, um, and, and it's there that God instructs them to send 12 spies out into the land to find out what it's all about um, and then to report back to the people. The spies are gone for 40 days. At the end of 40 days, the spies give the report. Caleb and Joshua, well, they've got good news. We can do this. This is an awesome place. We ought to go up and go take this place. But the other 10, not so much. They weren't all that excited about it. In fact, it says, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They're scary. We're like grasshoppers in their, in their sight. And because of this negative report, the people rebel against the concept of going into the promised land. They just say, we're just not going to go. We're not going to go. And as a result, God tells Moses that the people are going to end up wandering. Um, verse Numbers 14, 34. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. And then it's, it's at, it, and so, and, and the idea of the 40 years is that by the time 40 years are over, all the adults who made this decision that they're going to rebel, all of them will be dead, except for Joshua and Caleb. So that's kind of the background, is that 
uh, of, I think this is kind of important in understanding this psalm. So now we're ready for the psalm. Verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. The word dwelling place, the Hebrew word is ma'on. It means a dwelling, a habit, habitation, a refuge. It's a place of safety. You have been our dwelling place, our place of safety through all generations. Our safety is in God. Our safety, our sense of safety is in God. Have you ever been scared of stuff? You know, where like somebody's threatened you or, I remember we went through a period, I don't know, what was it, like three, four years ago, where um, I, I even got a death threat. It was, uh, it was a, little bit, a little bit freaky. Somebody, somebody taped a death threat to the, to the door of the church. I knew who it was. And the guy was kind of crazy. And so, and for a while, we went to bed at night with, and he knew where I live. And the guy was just going through, and he was an alcoholic and uh, bipolar. And just, and so for a while, we, uh, we went to bed at night with baseball bats next to our bed, you know, because, uh, uh, you know. Um, and so what do you count on for security? Some people, it's a, their security is, is a well-paying job. Others find security in their retirement counts. Others find re in security in a baseball bat or, or a gun. You know, I'm going to get a gun, get my, you know, concealed and carry permit, you know, and carry my gun. A woman in her 80s was determined that she would keep driving. Sounds just like my mom. Naturally, her family was concerned about her slower reflexes. She would go home at night alone, so they were disturbed about her safety. They told her about muggings, kidnappings, and carjackings. They, they thought that that would keep her at home, but it didn't. Instead, she went out and she bought a gun, a 38 Special. That's not like my mom. Um, she didn't know a thing about handling a gun, but she loaded it up, shoved it in her purse. She decided she would use it if somebody gave her problems. Well, she's walking out of the store during the Christmas season. She's got all her packages. She looks over and she sees these three guys in the car and they're slamming the door. She says, this is my moment. She reaches into her purse. She pulls out her gun, walks right up to the car window and says, get out of my car. Get away from behind that steering wheel. You guys move. The three guys get out and they run in three separate directions. By now, a crowd had gathered, and they're all staring at her and smiling, and she's feeling pretty good about herself. So she put her gun in her purse, and she gets her keys out, and the keys didn't fit. It wasn't her car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, an 80-year-old carjacker. I have some safety tips. For safety's sakes, do not ride in automobiles. They cause 20% of all fatal accidents. For safety's sake, do not stay at home. 17% of all accidents do occur in the home. Do, third, do not walk on the streets or sidewalks. 14% of all accidents happen to pedestrians. Do not travel by air, rail, or water. 16% of all accidents happen on these. But only 0.001% of all deaths occur in worship services at church. And those are all related to previous physical disorders. Hence, the safest place you could be at any time is here at church. You pay attention to that, those of you who are watching online. You should be in church. It doesn't count if you're watching it. No, I'm just teasing. Unless you walk here. <laughs> so go to church. It could save your life. Actually, God has been the place of safety for humanity always. God has always been our place of safety. That's where you're going to find the peace. That's where you're going to find a sense of security is in him. In, in Moses' day, whether it was the generation that rejected God's plan or the generation that conquered the promised land, it was still true that safety was found in trusting in God. In verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God has always existed, and God will always exist. He is, he is <coughs> eternal in the sense that he has always existed and always will exist. Man's a little different. Man has not always existed. You, you did not exist before you were conceived. It's at the point of conception that you come into being. Now, 
when we are conceived, we are all eternal and that we all have eternal souls that will live forever, either in heaven with God or in hell. But man is not everlasting in the sense that man has always existed. Only God is everlasting. Verse 3, you turn man to destruction and say, verse 3, return, O children of men. You turn man to destruction. And the word for destruction is the word for dust. You turn man to dust. Um, it's a result of Adam's sin. Genesis 3.19, in this, this is out of, because of Adam's sin, God said, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. You turn man into dust. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. A thousand years in your sight. God lives outside of time. It's funny because there's a whole bunch of TV shows now that are all dealing with time travel. It seems everybody wants to do time travel now. That's the latest science fiction thing. I don't know how they keep it all straight. Um, uh, but God lives outside of our sense of time. When the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, when he is the one who was, who is, and who is to come, God, at his present age, is living two million years ago. Long before he ever created the heavens and the earth. God, at his present age, is living right now. And God, at his present age, is living two million years in the future. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That kind of blows our mind. But a thousand years of our time is just like a day to God. 2 Peter 3.8, Peter said, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Moses said it first. Verse 5, You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. Talking about men. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. And so he's talking about man, how man is not so everlasting. Verse 7, For we have been consumed by your anger and by your, by your wrath we are terrified. Consumed by your anger. The Israelites knew this. That's what they're living through for these 40 years. They are being consumed by God's wrath because they would not trust him. They would not believe and so the, God's going to wait until all the rebels are dead. Um, and even though God would bring punishment for their disobedience, they just keep rebelling over and over and over again. Now, without Jesus, this principle is true for everybody. We are consumed by his wrath. Everybody will face God's wrath. But for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, things change. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.9, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse doesn't really apply to those of you who trust in the Lord. Verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. You have set our iniquities before you. And the principle is that he does see. I think that there are some things that I do that I kind of have this feeling that nobody, I don't think anybody knows what I, everything that I do. Um, or get, I'm not going to get caught. Okay, babe, so it's freaking 5 o'clock after a long day studying. That's what I come home to. Trash has been gone through. It's my fault. I left it, or I, I left it kind of full. So my question is, who, who did it? Who's the culprit? Well, we got a couple options. Let's see. We got Gear and we got Xena. What about Tank? I wonder if Tank had anything to do with it. Tank, do you know about the trash? You'll look on his face. Do you know face. anything about the trash, Tank? Because uh, I don't know who could have done something like that. I mean, you're the adult, you're in charge, and yet somehow the trash got into you. Can you tell me what happened? Yeah, can you tell me what happened? Ah, sit down. Tank, sit down. 
Do you know how this happened, Dave? I don't know how it happened. I'm confused. <laughs> the Bible says in Hebrews 4.13, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You know what's even scarier? Is that not only does God know, but every once in a while he lets others peek in on the secrets too. Um, that's kind of even scarier. The prophet Ezekiel was given this experience in a vision. He's in Babylon, and God gives him an, a, a, a glimpse of things that were going on secretly in Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 8, he writes, So I went in and saw, he goes into the temple in this vision, and saw there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. That's the Sanhedrin, the elders, the, the leaders. And in their midst stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and with a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. To me, it's almost, it's almost I mean, even though he's, he's portraying this as if he's watching what's going on in the temple, I just can't help but think that he's almost getting a peek into what, what's in these guys' minds. The things that are painted on the walls of their minds. Nothing is hidden from God. And help with your sin, whatever it is, Help doesn't come when you cover things up. It only makes it worse. Help only comes when you acknowledge that God sees and God is aware. And I have found in some areas in my life that I have to go beyond acknowledging it to God. I have to bring it out to people around me. To bring things out into the light. Don't, don't think that you can get by by just covering things up. God sees and when we open up to the light, that's when things start to change. Verse 9. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. The days, he says the days of our lives are are 70 years. Isn't that like a soap opera? The days of our lives or something like that? I just, I, just, I just realized that. Anyway, he says the days of our lives are 70 years. Some look at this as, as if Moses is giving us a general rule of thumb about the length of a person's life. Could be. It could be. If, if the days of our lives are 70 years and if by reason of strength, if, you, if you're doing really good, if you're in good health, maybe you'll go to 80, something like that. If at 70 years... I've only got 10 years left. That scares me. Not really. But it shakes me up a little bit. And you have 10 and a half years left. I just got to get that in there, you know. <laughs> it's a sobering thought. If I only have 10, and, if I only have 10 years left, what am I going to do? over the next 10 years. I've been, in, I've been doing ministry for, you know, 40 some years. How am I going to finish the last 10? Put yourself in that equation. Put yourself in that equation. And if this was indeed written after the events of Kadesh Barnea, that's kind of heavy because, because he's thinking about, uh, you know what, all these people are going to die. All these adults around me who were here rebelling against God, they're all going to die. The days, all our days have passed away in your wrath. Verse 11. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. As the fear of you, so is your wrath. New Living Translation puts it this way. Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. See, the principle, friends, is that God is just. 
And what that means is that God will not allow things to go unpunished. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Because there's plenty of injustice in this world. There's plenty. Somebody was telling me the other day, a dear friend was telling me that there was a, because there was an initiative on the, on the California ballot about the death penalty. And he voted against the death penalty. And I said, and I, how could you do that? You know, and I explained to him you know, that I think that there's a biblical uh, validation for the, the, for the state. This, God gives the state, this is Romans 13, God gives the state the sword to punish evildoers. There's nothing wrong with allowing the state to put people to death for things that are worthy of, of death. When the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, it's not any kind of killing, it's murder. You shall not murder. And if you murder, then you're supposed to be paying the penalty, which is uh, putting to death. But he said to me, the reason I vote, he said, the reason I voted against it is that we have so much injustice in our, in our, in our world. We're the only people who are put to death on, uh, for, for killing someone are people who are too poor to, a, uh, to afford a good attorney to get them off. And... Um, and, and, and some people might look at that as saying, oh, that's, 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 you know, our justice system is much better than that. But I, I understand where he's coming from. I understand where he's coming from, especially because this is the experience he's lived growing up where he grew up in, in life. And so um, there's a lot of injustice in this world. But I got to tell you, God is just. And people who deserve punishment for their sin will receive punishment if they haven't called out to God for mercy, if they haven't asked Jesus to forgive them, if they haven't applied the blood of the Lamb to their, to their sin. Jesus said, you know, see, the fear, so is the fear of you, so is your wrath. Jesus said, dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. That's a good kind of fear. And if you're not right with God, you ought to be very, very afraid because you're on shaky ground. As the fear of you, so is your wrath. Verse 12. Here's one of the key verses of this, of this passage. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And I want to, the lesson I want to kind of pull out of this is the importance of learning to find God's will. A wise person will realize that they're not going to be around forever. And they're going to realize that what they need to do is figure out what God wants for their life. Ephesians 5 talks about this, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That's kind of this idea. Teach us in the number of our days. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Because of our days, because of who we are, because of, of, of the kind of place we are, where our world is at, we need to figure out what God wants for our life. What is God's will for me? Well, one thing that's very clear is that God wants you to be saved. Um, 1 Timothy 2 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires or who wills, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is God's will for people to be saved. Now, will everybody be saved? No. People will reject him. But does God want everybody to be saved? Yes, he does. Absolutely. God's will is also that we be spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is a waste, dissipation, but be filled. That's, con that's, an, that's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. And Ephesians 5.18 follows Ephesians 5.17, which is, understand what the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. God wants you to be filled with the Spirit. That's God's will for your life. And God's will are the plans that he has for you. Ephesians 2.10 We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has specific things for each of us. That are things that are designed for us with our strengths, our gifts, our weaknesses, our history. And the more we walk with them, 
the more we study his word, the more we grow in prayer, we will see his plans unfold for us. He has things that he has for us to do. Want to know, with what, want to, know what to do with the days you have left? Start with these things. Make sure that you're doing these things. Verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy that we may be that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. I like this phrase, satisfy us early with your mercy. The word early, the Greek word for, uh, the Greek word, the Hebrew word, su for, for early is boker. The Hebrew word boker, which means morning, break of day, beginning of the day. When you visit Israel, that's one of the things they teach you to say, you know, in the morning. Say this to your tour guide, boker tov. Tov is the word for good which Boker Tov means good morning. Um, and so what did the Israelites do in the wilderness in the morning? They gathered manna. He says, satisfy us early in the morning with your mercy. What did they do in the morning? They went out and gathered manna. I think about how that applies to us with our time with God in the morning. Pray. Ask God to guide you. Open the scriptures. Ask God to speak to you. Let him feed you with the bread from heaven. Satisfy us early with your mercy. I like that. Verse 15, make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us Yes, establish the work of our hands. I like this last phrase, verse 17, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. The word beauty means, it carries the idea of kindness, pleasantness, delightfulness, favor. Let the beauty, let the favor of the Lord, let the kindness, let the pleasantness of the Lord our God be upon us. <clears throat> then the last thing here in this psalm, I just want to talk about how our restoration is in Him. The beauty of the Lord is on us when we come to trust in Him, and he restores our lives. There's a story. This guy writes, I don't know who wrote this story. He says, the carpenter I hired to fix me, to help me fix up my old farmhouse had just finished a rough day, a rough first day on the job. A flat tire made him lose an hour of work. His electric saw quit. And now his ancient pickup refused to start. When I drove him home, he sat in stony silence. On arriving, he invited me to meet his family. As we walked toward the front door, he paused briefly at a small tree, touching the tips of the branches with both hands. When opening the door, he underwent an amazing transformation. His tanned face was wreathed with smiles, and he hugged his two small children and gave his wife a kiss. Afterward, he walked me to the car. We passed the tree, and my curiosity got the better of me. I asked him about what, he, what I'd seen him do earlier. He said, oh, 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 that's my trouble tree, he said. I know I can't help having troubles on the job, but one thing for sure, troubles don't belong in the house with my wife and my kids. So I just hang them up on the tree every night when I come home. In the morning, I pick them up again. Funny thing is, he smiled, when I come out in the morning to pick them up, there ain't nearly as many as I remember hanging up the night before. Well, that's kind of like what happens with us and the Lord. We have a trouble tree to go to. It's his tree that we need to learn to touch. Our troubles are healed at the cross. Peter writes, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Trusting Him brings restoration in our lives. We've got a couple songs we want to share. This is what we're doing as we're working through, through the um, psalms. We're stopping whenever there's a psalm that has some songs that we um, know to kind of help us put in context what this is all about. So we've got, hmm? Do we know the songs? Well, we, not really. Dave knows the first song. I know the second song. This is from uh, verse 2, a little bit. 
And I think we should just stand for this song because then they'll be awake when I teach the next song.
are faithful, never changing God. We endure wilderness by trusting in your love. Let's try that again. You are good. You are good. You are faithful, never changing. one more time. You are good. You are faithful. Never changing God. We endure the wilderness by trusting in your love. Oh God, our help in ages past. Our Okay, let's, uh, let's look at Psalm 91. Let's see if we can squeeze that one in. Psalm 91. Um, 
I'm calling this one the safe place. We um, kind of know a little bit what it's like to live in a place filled with fear. Anybody know what it's like to live in a land that has fear every once in a while? Within the last 15 years, you know, this radical terrorist thing, Islam thing, their goal is to strike what in people? Terror. That's why they're called terrorists. What's terror? It's fear. Um, even in our own recent political climate, what's been the goal of each party? To make you terribly afraid of what the other party's going to do. You know, so if one party gets in, you better be afraid. It's the end of the world. If the other party gets in, they say, oh, you better be afraid. It's the end of the world. Jesus described this in the end of days. He said, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What do the numbers 911 make you think of? Now, it used to be, more 16 years ago, it used to be that's what the number that you called for help, right? And then came the tower thing, the twin towers, and now we, we, we look at those numbers, we call it 911. Because of that, I want to encourage you, let's rethink the whole 911 thing. Instead, let's start thinking about Psalm 91 verse 1, okay? That you, you'll feel much better if we take 911 and start thinking of Psalm 91, verse 1. Verse 1 says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells in the secret place, the secret word secret place means a covering, shelter, hiding place, secrecy. It's a place of safety. He dwells in that safety place, that safe place with God. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. A fowler is somebody who's trying to trap birds, as if somebody just ought to get you, just going to catch you in their net. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. It says, under his wings you shall take refuge. Now, um, in an agrarian society, they understand this. You know, a mother bird uses its, her wings to cover and protect her babies. Jesus used the same language in Luke 13. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. He wants to protect us. He wanted to, but, but the people did not want it. And though this gives us a picture of protection, the wings that God's talking about, I don't think are bird wings. I don't think God's saying I'm a big chicken. Come hide under my... Bark, 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 bark. I think that's what he's talking about. I think what he's getting, he is giving us a picture. He's painting the picture of the mercy seat. That, that gold box that had the solid gold lid, the solid gold lid of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. And molded in one piece, on the same piece as the lid, were two angelic beings with their wings stretched out towards each other, forming kind of a canopy over the seat. God, God said in Exodus 25, and there, this is what God said to Moses, and there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in, the command, in commandment to the children of Israel. And this whole ark, the, 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 the tabernacle, was all meant to be a picture of heaven. It was designed to be like a model of heaven. And over God's throne are, are angels' wings. Um, this picture of God's throne, being under his wings, speaks of being in God's very presence. And the whole point here is that God wants us to stay close to him. True safety comes from that secret place with God. Jill Briscoe writes this. She's a pastor's wife, old day, old time pastor's wife uh, from England. She writes this, though I was barely six years of age, I well remember sitting by a roaring fire on a Sunday during World War II. Our family had fled the bombs that rained down on us one night, chasing us hundreds of miles away to the beautiful English Lake District, William Wordsworth country. 
The mists were gone and a storm had broken over our heads. The rain, like giant tears, slashed against the window pane and the thunder grumbled away as if it were angry. It had to, as, hadn't, had to hang around all day. I didn't like storms, and I, but I was old enough to understand that a bigger storm was raging, a war involving the entire, a, a war involving the entire world. But at the moment, it seemed far away. The fire was warm, and my father was relaxed, reading the paper, sitting in his big chair. Suddenly, as if he were aware, I needed a bit of reassurance. He put down his paper and smiled at me. Come here, little girl, he said in his quiet but commanding voice. And then I was safe in his arms, lying against his shoulder and feeling the beat of his heart. What a grand place to be. Here I could watch the rain and listen to the thunder all day. I've realized how my heavenly Father shelters me from the storms of life. When times of sorrow swamped me at my mother's funeral, I sought the reassurance of my father's presence. When winds of worry whipped away my confidence as I faced gangs of young people in street evangelism, I glanced up to see my father's face. When floods of fear rose in my spirit as I waited in a hospital room for the results of frightening tests, I sensed my heavenly father saying, Come here, little girl. I climbed into his arms, leaned against his shoulder, and murmured, Ah, this is a grand place to be. And as I rest in the safe place, knowing that my father is bigger than any storm that beats against the window pane of my life, I can watch the rains and listen to the thunder, knowing that everything is all right. Here I can feel the beat of my father's heart. God wants us to develop and cultivate that closeness under the shadow of his wings. We find that place at God's throne. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He said in verse 4, His truth shall be your shield and buckler. The word truth, emet, means firmness, faithfulness, truth or reliability. Like that idea of reliability or faithfulness. New Living Translation says, His faithful promises are your armor and protection. He's faithful. He will come through. You can count on Him. That's what protects your heart. Is God going to come through? Yes, God's going to come through. His truth, His faithfulness will be your shield and your, your protection. Verse 5, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Everyone else might go down but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the, of the wicked. He says you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. This is what comes from being in God's presence. We don't need to be afraid of the unknown. Verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give <coughs> his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Now, when he says in verse 9, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, your dwelling place, it's the psalmist is talking to us, to the reader. He's talking to another person. And when we too have made God our refuge, just like he has, we'll find that place of safety. He says, verse 10, no evil shall befall you. We may experience pain in this life, but the reality as believers is that in Jesus, even if we die, we go to heaven. No one can say that George Smith didn't have courage. He was a daring jet pilot in the 1950s, back when the sound barrier was first being broken, and he could face anything until he had to bail out of a jet going 805 miles an hour. This is Guidepost, uh, 1958. It's, it says, Though he survived, he was afraid of ever flying again. 
Then during his hospital stay, a nurse gave him an antidote to fear. And he took her words to heart. She said this, Courage, she said, is knowing the worst and discovering that in God's world, the very worst can't really hurt you. No evil shall befall you. He shall give his angels charge over you. Um, we'll talk just for a minute about God's angels. They are God's special created beings. They serve God and they do several things for God, including um, protection for us. When the king of Syria brought an entire army to capture the prophet Elisha, Elisha's servant was freaked out until Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. God had sent his angels to protect Elisha. They are there to protect us. They are there to encourage us. When Paul was a prisoner on a ship in a deadly storm, it says um, an angel showed up and he said, don't be afraid, Paul for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. God will send angels to encourage you. And I think some of you are my angels that do that. These things are available to us because Hebrews 1.14 says, Therefore angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. That's us. So they're there to help us. He says, he shall give his angels charge over you. Verse, 11, verse 12, in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Lest you dash your foot against a stone. I just got to say there are, I want to talk a little bit about risky business. Risky business. Though angels can do miraculous things to protect us, there are limits to what they will do. There are limits. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Satan quoted Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. And the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. It may not be God's idea to deliver you from every situation that you get yourself into. Um, Jesus said it would be tempting God or testing him if he were to jump. Um, don't presume that God's going to bail you out of every situation. He may not. Um, this is not a pr an excuse for reckless living. Somebody once said, I like this quote, never drive faster than your guardian angels can fly. <laughs> I like that. Never drive faster than your guardian's angel can fly. Verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. And I think this is a hint of the victory that God gives us over Satan, who is both a roaring lion and a serpent. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. Is it interesting that Satan didn't quote this verse to Jesus? <laughs> That would have been a lot of fun if Jesus said, and it also says. <laughs> anyway, verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Verse 14, it said, because he has set his love upon me. And so the last, the last lesson for the night is just love God. Just love God. All these things that he lists here, uh, deliverance, calling, and answer, God answering, God's presence, a long and full life, um, salvation, that comes from just loving God. Because he has set his love upon me. Paul wrote, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Stay close to God and love him. You want to learn the last song? There's one last song. 
It's just a little shorty thing. Um, it's an old song for me. Why don't we stand? It's from the first couple of verses. It's, this is written on, on, um, from the New American Standard. So. <laughs> written in a Johnny Cash key. He who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells ourselves in that secret place, in your presence, to enjoy our daddy's arm, to know that when the storms are raging, there is a place of peace, there is a place of safety, and it's with you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. God bless you guys. <laughs>